What would you get if you crossed Kisaragi Station with Silent Hill? If that idea intrigues you, then you would no doubt enjoy Harasaki, a Japanese novel written by Noshiro Ryo that was published in 2017. You wouldn't be alone either, as it also won the Reader's Prize at the 24th Japanese Horror Novel Awards as well. But what exactly is Harasaki about? What dark twists and turns will you find in it? And is it, perhaps, the novel, or even manga, for you? We're going to deep dive into the novel this week, taking not just a look at the story, but exploring its terrifying twists and delving into whether it's worth adding to your bookshelf or not. Spoiler alert, yes it is. And if you want to pick up a copy for yourself, you can find a link in the description. But now, let's head on in. Naturally, there will be spoilers galore here, so keep that in mind. The book opens with a young man by the name of Kambara Masaki, having drinks and dinner in a small bar in a town called Takenoyama. He's just visiting the area because his girlfriend, who he's about to marry, is from here, and they've arrived in town on holiday to meet her parents for the first time. Well, kind of. Masaki likes to travel alone, and so his girlfriend, Momosaki Hinata, has let him go ahead one day early, so he can enjoy probably the last solo trip of his life. Sounds a little depressing when you put it that way, but it is what it is. Takenoyama is a snowy little town that has a hot spring and, well, not much else. It's so small that the only school there closed down 10 or so years prior, and the only people still around are those who have lived there for generations. Hinata's parents run the local hot spring inn, but for some unknown reason, she doesn't live with them, nor has she seen them since she left elementary school. Instead, she lives with her grandparents for… reasons. Yes, reasons. The first sign, perhaps, that something isn't quite right. At any rate, while drinking at the bar and waiting for Hinata's arrival the following day, an interesting customer pops in, already a little drunk, and the owner chastises him, remarking that if he's not careful, then Harasaki will get him. Naturally, Masaki is intrigued. Who or what is Harasaki? Turns out Takenoyama has quite a few interesting urban legends, of which Harasaki is just one. According to the legend, Harasaki does just what it says. It's a creature that lurks in the dark corners of Takenoyama's streets, and it will pull you into its own world and then slash you in the stomach. It's mostly a tale used to frighten children so they'll behave and not go out at night. But still, Masaki is intrigued, and it adds an interesting bit of colour to an otherwise cold, dreary town. The next day, Hinata is waiting at the station to take the train in to Takenoyama when someone suddenly approaches her. The girl is tiny and looks maybe junior high age, which confuses her for a second. She grows even more confused when the girl seems to know who she is, but Hinata has no idea who she might be. Of course she doesn't, because Hinata has a small problem. She doesn't remember anything from elementary school other than a single image. The setting sun behind some snow in the distance. Other than that, the first 12 years of her life are blank and she doesn't really know why. All she remembers is that she has lived with her grandparents since junior high, and for reasons, her parents still live in Takenoyama, but she has never actually seen them since. Because, you know, reasons. Hinata is embarrassed, however, that this girl, Aihara Sayako, knows her and they were apparently good friends at school, but she can't for the life of her remember who she is. But rather than embarrassing herself further by telling Sayoko that she doesn't know who she is, she just pretends that, sure, she remembers, long time no see. Things get a little awkward when Sayoko wants her to call her by her childhood nickname, but Hinata can't remember what that was. So, Sayoko it is. Sayoko tells Hinata that their old school is about to be torn down, so once they arrive in Takenoyama, they should head over and check it out one last time. Hinata was supposed to meet with Masaki, but she figures it can't hurt to have a quick look with an apparent childhood friend. 
She takes her phone out to message him that she'll be visiting her old school with a friend, and then, suddenly, everything goes black. It's as if the train has been sucked into total darkness, and then next thing she knows, she passes out. When she comes back too, she finds herself at Takenoyama Station. Seems she safely arrived, but for some odd reason, she's the only person on the train. Sayako is nowhere to be seen. Her watch says it's 7pm, which is very bad because she was supposed to meet with Masaki at 4pm. Whoops. For some reason, her phone is also out of range. She is well and truly alone, and as she steps off the train and onto the snowy platform, her fears begin to grow even larger. She literally is all alone. There's not a single soul in sight. What on earth happened on the train, and where did she end up? She explores the station for a bit before stumbling upon Sayoko. Oh, thank God she isn't alone. But she doesn't have any better news for her. She has also been looking around and hasn't seen anyone else either. It's just the two of them. They head outside and, to Hinata's horror, they discover a dead body lying face down in the snow. It appears she has been stabbed, but she's also holding something in her hand. A note. The note also doesn't make matters any better. This is an execution ground. But I haven't done anything wrong. They're still watching me, even now. And they're watching you looking down on me too. They're everywhere. They're just like shadow monsters. No matter how long you wait, time won't pass. Daybreak can be found in the Hot Spring District. I wandered around that area until I almost passed out, but it seems it wasn't meant to be for me. Well, that's certainly creepy. What does it all mean? This is an execution ground? Who are they, these so-called shadow monsters? And why are they watching them? And time has stopped? It's at this point that Hinata realises both her watch and phone still say 7pm despite how much time has passed since she got off the train. Things just keep getting weirder. But with nothing else to go on, the pair decide to head to the Hot Spring District and see if they can find answers there. They pass through a tunnel on the way, a tunnel that has its own urban legend as well. Supposedly, slave labour was used to build it long ago, and the bodies of those who died were buried in its walls. An all-too-common story. While inside, Hinata is sure something brushes past her, but it's too dark to see anything. They emerge on the other side just in time to see a shadowy figure seemingly jump to its death over the cliff. Sayoko is disappointed that Hinata hesitated to help, but Hinata naturally can't stop thinking of the note and the shadow monsters. And on that note, they turn around to find themselves face to face with the actual thing. A shadow monster. This one is holding a hammer, which it brings down in Hinata's direction. She's able to dodge it, and in the confusion, both she and Sayoko take off running, in opposite directions. Hinata now has no idea where she is, but in the distance, she sees the sunset. She heads towards it, and everything goes black. She wakes up to find herself in… a memory? That's what it seems to be and she's looking at the world from the point of view of a child, walking with her friend. This friend tells her they shouldn't hang out for a while, and starts to cry, and the sight pierces her heart. Meanwhile, Masaki has been waiting for Hinata all this time, and is starting to grow worried she hasn't shown up yet. The snow outside is pretty heavy, so he borrows some boots from the owner of the inn he's staying in, and decides to look for her himself. As it turns out, they're not really here to meet Hinata's parents, but she doesn't know that. Hinata's parents actually died in a car crash eight years ago, and that's why she's never seen them. Her grandparents were unable to tell her the truth, however, fearing it would crush her. So they lied and told her that reasons were keeping them apart. Now they've asked Masaki to tell her the truth, because it's still too painful for them. Yikes. 
but before long, he finds her bag in a pile of snow in front of the abandoned school. So she is here, somewhere, and she no doubt needs help. Hinata, meanwhile, has come back to her senses and finds herself in the hot spring district with no idea of how she got there. She writes a note for Sayoko letting her know where she is and tapes it to a nearby map, just in case. When she checks her phone, however, she notices that it now says 9pm. Two hours have passed. There's also several messages from Masaki. He saw her original message, but now that she still hasn't shown up or replied to him, he's growing worried. Unfortunately, she can't reply because the phone is out of range again. Nothing to do but keep soldiering on. Before long, she comes across yet another dead body face down in the snow that appears to have been stabbed in the stomach. This woman is also holding a note in her hand. This is the last page of my notebook. I looked for people, but all I found were black monsters. The woman explains how she appears to be all alone out here, how terrified she is, and how she found a public phone, but she can't bring herself to use it. She's weak. And now, it seems, she's dead. Hinata finds the phone and tries it, seemingly getting through, but the message repeats over and over robotically, and she realises she's being toyed with. Another shadow monster appears beneath it, and she runs off in terror, soon finding herself in front of the Harada store. She takes refuge inside and realises she's both hungry and thirsty, but there's nothing there that looks vaguely edible or drinkable. At the top of the stairs, she sees a terribly out-of-place sunset, and when she opens the door, once again falls into somebody else's point of view. Another memory? Or something else? Everything around her is on fire, and a dark, burning figure crawls towards her, groaning in pain and very obviously seeking help. But... It's far too late to help them now. Hinata wakes up but finds she's unable to move. That same dark figure from her vision crawls towards her, and she cries, praying for it to go away and leave her alone. Right as it's about to claim her, Sayoko shows up and kicks it into next week. They flee the building, but something about that encounter seemed odd. Like the shadowy figure was more of a victim seeking help than a murderous attacker like the Hammer Man. At any rate, Sayoko goes off and asks her why she went into such a creepy place to begin with. When Hinata looks at the shop again, it's blackened and burnt down, despite the fact that when she first saw it, it was perfectly normal. What on earth is going on? The pair stop to breathe for a moment. Sayoko gives her a drink of melted snow, which we'll have to do for now, and then gives her her scarf because she feels bad about losing her when the Hammer Man attacked. The time is now 11pm, however, which means that each time Hinata is sucked into one of these visions, it seems to move forward by two hours, which means they have to keep finding that strange sunset. With no ideas on where to go next, they decide to finally visit Hinata's parents' house. Masaki, meanwhile, drops by the local police box to report Hinata missing. Turns out, the cop is the same jovial drunk he ran into the day before, a man by the name of Hasegawa Shunichi. Small town. And it gets even smaller when it turns out that Shunichi is Hinata's cousin. Huh. He promises they'll organise a search party, but doesn't seem terribly concerned. In fact, he seems perfectly complacent, which weirds Masaki out. A woman, his cousin, is missing, and he's carrying on like it's time for a cigarette break. Shunichi tells him to go back to the inn and rest. They'll take care of the rest. Masaki is suspicious, but does as he's told. Hinata and Sayako arrive at Hinata's family home, only to find it's massive. A three-storey building with gorgeous tiled roofing that seems far too nice to be all the way out here in the middle of nowhere. Even stranger, this hot spring inn is called Hinata. They named it after their one and only daughter and she had no idea. 
She wonders why she's never seen them all this time, why they never even sent a single letter, and wonders how they'll feel upon seeing her now, after all this time. Will they welcome her, or...? Everything seems to be locked, and when Sayako heads off to find another way in, the doors seem to suck Hinata in. Sayako says she'll find another way in, and, once again, she's all alone. Hinata explores a little, and the place seems somewhat nostalgic, triggering little fragments of memories here and there, like reading books in her favourite chair while waiting for her parents. What on earth happened to her when she was a child? What is going on? She hears voices arguing violently over something, voices she doesn't want to hear, and then suddenly, a shadow appears, bringing a hammer down hard on her shoulder. The Hammer Man is back. She manages to flee, but the Hammer Man gives chase. She ends up in the kitchen with nowhere to go, and so grabs a knife and waits. When the Hammer Man moves in to attack again, she pounces, stabbing him in the stomach. He seems more confused than anything, and just as she fears he's about to end matters, Sayoko shows up and distracts him, pulling him into another chase away from Hinata. At the same time, Hinata spots light behind a door, opening it to fall into another vision. This time, two people are sitting at a table. Her parents? They don't look happy and soon break into an argument. They're apparently afraid of rumours spreading around town and the inn losing customers because of it. All because Hinata killed someone. She can barely believe her ears. She killed someone? What? Her parents continue to argue, and they realise that nobody is going to want to stay in the inn when they realise their daughter is a murderer. Their lives are over. Hinata wakes up in great pain from the hit she took to the shoulder, but she's still alive. She takes a moment to process what she heard and saw. She's a murderer? The words echo over and over in her head. How could this be? She doesn't remember any of this. She checks her phone to see more time has passed and there's another message from Masaki. He found her bag near the school and wants to know where she is. She is, of course, unable to reply. Sayoko is waiting nearby, however, and the two decide to get the hell out of Dodge and take refuge at Sayoko's place this time. The Hammer Man is still lurking somewhere in the building, after all. They can rest up there and think about what to do next. As they leave, Hinata finally pushes herself to ask what she has feared all this time. Can they talk about what happened in the past? Finally, Sayoko mutters, her face clearly not happy. Seems there is indeed more going on here than meets the eye. When Masaki calls her grandparents and reveals that Hinata has gone missing, however, he finds their reaction odd. They're rather calm and don't seem to mind at all. Things get even stranger when he discovers that Shunichi hasn't actually organised a search party like he said he would. Instead, he's just chilling in his police box like nothing is wrong. She's been taken by Harasaki, he says, like this explains everything. As it turns out, this isn't the first time Hinata has gone missing in Takenoyama. This exact same scenario has happened several times before, and organising a search party is useless because she'll show up on her own in the morning anyway. Besides, nobody in town would look for her. Why? Because she murdered someone called Harada Sakiko when she was just a child. Harada. That was the name of the store Hinata entered earlier, wasn't it? Hmm. Hinata and Sayoko arrive back at her place and Hinata gets patched up. They finally broach the subject of Hinata's missing memories, and Sayoko reveals that, yes, this place they're currently trapped in is actually an execution ground. A place where the dead drag criminals to punish them. Hinata wonders why Sayoko is there then, to which she reveals that she also killed someone. Harada Sakiko. Wait, 
Weren't we just told that Hinata did that? And yes, that shadow they saw earlier at the store was indeed Sakiko. Apparently, Hinata and Sayako killed both her and her family by burning their store down. Why? Well, Sakiko bullied the girls and did terrible things to them, pushing them to the brink. Of course, Hinata remembers none of this, but things do seem to line up. No evidence was found at the scene, but Hinata was seen fleeing the building, so people suspected she was behind it. As a result, everyone turned against her parents, and with their business crumbling and lives falling apart, they killed themselves. Hinata is shocked, but somehow not surprised. Everything suddenly makes sense. And as for the Hammer Man, well, it turns out that that's their old teacher, Mr. Tanaka. He ignored the bullying that was taking place, but after the incident with Sakiko, well, he took his own life as well. The two rest up for what little good that does in a place like this, share a little food when they wake up, and then Hinata gives Sayako her watch. She has her phone to check the time, and she considers it payback for Sayako lending her her scarf. She still remembers nothing, but at this point she has no choice but to keep moving forward. It seems that until she unlocks all her memories, there will be no way out of here. Next stop, the school. On the way, they're attacked by the Hammer Man, no, Mr. Tanaka, again, who takes Sayako down. Hinata is faced with a choice. Stop and help her old friend, potentially dying in the process herself, or running to safety. She chooses the latter, leaving behind the one person who has been helping her all this time to die at the hands of a maniac. She understands now why she's here. She really is a terrible person deserving of punishment. She's not just weak, she's apparently a murderer as well. Why wouldn't she be here? Back in Takenoyama, Masaki uncovers more of the truth. This is apparently the fourth time Hinata has gone missing, and while the villagers tried to find her at first, over time they just stopped caring. Not only was she impossible to find, but she would show up perfectly fine the next day anyway, so why bother? And this, it seems, is how the Harasaki urban legend was born. People connected her disappearances to her murdering Harada Sakiko. Hara Saki. Harasaki. It's Sakiko's vengeful spirit making her disappear, presumably for some sort of punishment, before returning her without her memories. Then she does it again, over and over, trapping Hinata in perpetual torment. Masaki refuses to believe that any of this could be true, but Shunichi tells him to call Hinata's grandfather. Then he'll understand. And yes, as it turns out, he's telling the truth. Each time Hinata has disappeared, she told her grandparents that she wanted to go to Takenoyama suddenly and got extremely violent when they disagreed, physically assaulting them and going anyway. And, each time, she returned by herself with no memories of any of it happening. They are, quite frankly, scared of their granddaughter, so when she said she wanted to go with Masaki this time, well, they saw an opportunity for someone to take her off their hands. The conversation is about to end when Shunichi takes the phone and demands her grandfather tell Masaki the full truth. He's still holding back. What about that other incident Hinata caused? But instead, her grandfather hangs up the phone. Wait, you mean it gets even worse than this? What on earth could it be? Hinata meanwhile stops by the Harada store on her way to the school and again bumps into the shadow. Into Sakiko. This is all her fault. She bullied Hinata and Sayako, making them go to such extreme measures, and now she's punishing them. And now... Because of her, Sayako is dead. She attacks the shadow, screaming at her to return her friend, before passing out next to her. When she next awakes, she's at the school. And what do you know, 
there's another dead body lying in front of it, holding a note. The handwriting looks familiar, and the note reveals that, finally, she understands everything. It will all become clear if she just goes to the 6th grade class 2 classroom, and then the art storeroom on the first floor. She cannot do it, she's not strong enough. But if she goes there, then she'll be able to see Satchan and apologize. Satchan. That's what Sayoko wanted her to call her. Hinata finally rolls the body over and again is shocked but not surprised. It's like looking in a mirror. The body is her. Or at least a previous version of her. All the bodies were her. So then, this isn't her first time here. What does it all mean? Hinata finds the classroom in question and, after entering, passes out. Here, we get to the heart of the mystery. Finally, everything is revealed. Hinata relives the pivotal moments of her past that all led to this very moment. When she was in the sixth grade, Hinata suddenly found herself rather friendless. For whatever reason, the kids in this tiny countryside village treated each other, well, depending on their parents' standing in the world. If your parents had a great job, then you were treated great. Your parents had a not-so-great job? Good luck making friends. It was basically a class system, and because Hinata's parents ran an inn, well, people looked down on them, and thus her as well. This didn't bother Hinata too much, but then, one day, a new kid showed up. Harada Sakiko, a transfer from Tokyo. She was cute, bright, cheerful, and a kid from the big city. Everyone wanted to be her friend, and she was friendly with everyone in return. But for whatever reason, she took a special interest in Hinata, apparently not giving any craps about what her parents did, and the two became close friends. But this friendship was soon put to the test by another classmate everyone called Ragdoll. This girl's parents didn't work, nor did they attempt to take care of their child. As a result, she was always dirty and messy, and the other kids bullied her mercilessly. Sakiko, being the gentle-hearted person she was, took exception to this and tried to befriend the girl. That, of course, made the bullies turn their attentions to her instead. This greatly upset Hinata, who felt that her one and only friend was being taken away from her. That vision she saw of the young girl crying and telling her they shouldn't see each other anymore, that was Sakiko, trying to protect Hinata from the bullying as well. And all of this was because of that ragdoll. It was all her fault. And so she hit upon an idea to get things back to normal. She would broker a deal with the bullies. They would leave Sakiko alone and turn their attentions back to the ragdoll. Sure, she was never their target in the first place, but in return, both Hinata and Sakiko would have to publicly denounce the ragdoll as well. She needed to know her place. Hinata agreed. When the time came, well, it went about as well as one would expect. Everyone ambushed the ragdoll after school and started beating her up. Sakiko, sorry, Satchan, stepped in to help, but Hinata pulled her back. She told the ragdoll in no uncertain terms that she was unwelcome to come near them ever again, and urged Satchan to do the same. The moment of truth. Would Satchan follow the group? and let the other girl be bullied in her stead? Or would she stand up for her and continue to take the brunt of the abuse? Harada Sakiko, also known as Sachan, chose the latter. She told the ragdoll to stay away from them and left with Hinata, somewhat surprising her. Sachan always admired Hinata's ability to make tough decisions, something she could never do, and that was always one of the reasons she looked up to her. The two part ways and say their goodbyes, not knowing it would be the last time they ever spoke. That night, Harada's door burnt down, with her still inside. Back in Takenoyama, 
Masaki sits down with Shunichi to hear about this other incident Hinata was involved in. As it turns out, Sakiko wasn't the only person she murdered. She also killed her teacher, Mr. Tanaka, and another classmate in the art storeroom at school. That's the reason the school closed down, and being that Hinata was only a child at the time, details of the incident were never publicly released. Even in Takenoyama, people don't know the full details, other than the little bits they were able to gather from the news. Masaki is about to marry not just a murderer, but someone with the blood of numerous people on her hands. But how is it that she doesn't remember any of this? Well, nobody is quite sure. It seems to be a defense mechanism inside her own head to protect her from the horrific acts she committed as a child. She was sent to a juvenile facility after she was arrested, and when she emerged three years later, she didn't seem to remember a single thing from before the incidents. Even stranger, she seemed to have created fake memories, where she lived a perfectly normal junior high life as well to replace her time in the facility. At every step, her brain took measures to erase everything that happened, and instead replaced it with something more… bearable. And now, with the full truth behind him, it's up to Masaki to decide what to do next. If he wants to go find Hinata and wait for her return, that's up to him. Shunichi, however, recommends he get the hell out of Dodge. She's not worth it. She's a violent murderer who can't even acknowledge what she did. And if he's unlucky enough, he might be next. Masaki, however, decides that he'll make that decision after seeing Hinata again and discussing matters with her. He sets off for the school in the hopes of running into her there. Hinata, meanwhile, wakes up and now remembers almost everything. She's confused, however, by Satchan. All this time she thought that Sayako was her childhood friend Satchan, but as it turns out, it was actually Sakiko? But then, who is Sayako? What's going on? She makes her way towards the art storeroom and one last sunset. Time for her final memory to unlock. Hinata wakes up in the dark. She's apparently in the art storeroom, but her hands are bound and her mouth covered. The place is a mess, and she racks her brain trying to figure out how she got here. Ragdoll. It had to be her. And it was her that killed Sakiko. She set fire to Harada store after Sakiko publicly rejected her, and because Hinata went to see her that night, she was seen fleeing the scene. Hinata had nothing to do with the fire. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that means... The lights turn on, and Ragdoll appears before her. No, not Ragdoll. Aihara Sayako. It was her all along, and as her eyes adjust to the light, Hinata realises she's not alone. Mr. Tanaka's dead body lies just a few feet away. He has been stabbed to death. Also, Sayako's work. Seemed the incident with Hinata and Sakiko publicly denouncing her was the final straw and she snapped. After the bullies were done with her, she went and set Sakiko's house, Harada's door, on fire, killing her and her family. At school the following day, she acted like nothing happened. But once school ended, well, she went into the art storeroom and Mr. Tanaka just happened to be there. The perfect opportunity. He tried to attack her with a nearby hammer, but she was too quick and stabbed him to death. Nothing less than he deserved for ignoring what went on right beneath his nose. Then she knocked Hinata out as she was getting ready to leave and brought her to the storeroom as well. It's late at night and there's no one else around. No one to hear her scream. Hinata finds a nail on the ground near her hands. Just the thing she needs to cut herself free, but she needs to buy some time. She tries to convince Sayoko that she's perfectly right. She did nothing wrong and this was everyone else's fault. All the while, trying to contain the rage that's building inside her as well. No, everything is Sayoko's fault. 
It's her own fault that she was bullied, and it's her fault that Sachan is now dead. And, as soon as the opportunity presents itself, she's going to take her revenge. It doesn't take too long. She finally cuts the tape binding her hands and then jams the nail into her neck. She grabs the dropped knife and, remembering how Satchan was taken from her, attacks. She reveals to Sayoko how the whole incident where Satchan turned her down was all orchestrated by her. Everything is her own fault. Hinata and Satchan did nothing wrong. It was all Sayoko's fault and this is nothing less than she deserves. Hinata isn't the one in the wrong, she is. Sayoko's ghost then appears behind the fully grown Hinata, back in the present and finally in possession of all her memories. Now, the full truth has been revealed. It was Sayoko who killed Sakiko and Mr. Tanaka, and then Hinata killed her. Hinata was ultimately blamed for all three deaths and sent to a juvenile facility, and while there, her parents ended up taking their own lives due to the collapse of their business and family. Hinata then protected herself by blocking all those memories off. But, over the years, Sayoko's vengeful spirit summoned her back numerous times to punish her. How dare she live her life unaware of what she did, of the pain she caused, of the fact that, yes, she is a murderer. Harasaki isn't Harada Sakiko. Harasaki is I Hara Sayako. This isn't the first time she's done this, and it won't be the last either. She'll keep summoning Hinata back to Takenoyama over and over, making her experience that pain all over again, until she finally wakes up and admits to herself that she was wrong. Until she accepts that she's a murderer who cut one person's life short, who ruined that life so badly that two other people died because of it. It's all her fault, and she needs to own up to it. She's a ghost after all. She can do what she wants, and she'll keep doing it until she's had her fill of revenge. Hinata takes a moment to contemplate what that means exactly. Each time she's come back to Takenoyama, she died because she was unable to face the truth, and each time she reacted violently, assaulting her grandparents when they tried to stop her. Will she keep doing this for the rest of her life? Will she, one day, hurt Masaki if he tries to stop her? She can't bear that thought. At that moment, Satchan's spirit also appears, this time as she appeared in life, and not the burnt, disfigured shadow she saw at the store. She tells Hinata to run, grabbing the knife from Sayoko before she's able to attack. But this time, she refuses. No more running. She takes the knife from Satchan and places it before Sayoko. The decision is now hers. If she wants to kill Hinata, then she'll wake up with no memory of what happened and they can continue this crazed ritual until Hinata dies for real. But if, on the off chance, she can find it in herself to forgive her for what happened, then Hinata will leave and never come back again. But more importantly, if she forgives her, then Satchan will no longer have to suffer either, and she will also be free to move on, no longer trapped in Harasaki's realm of torture. Sayako glares hatefully at her before, finally, slowly, fading away to nothing. Her choice has been made. Hinata is free. Satchan is free. It's all over. Two girls torn over a friend they both wanted for themselves. A girl who, even after death, remained caught between them in eternal torment. It seems, finally, that they were both able to put the past behind them and all move on. Hinata says a final tearful goodbye to her childhood friend Satchan and decides to take the knife with her. It will forever remind her of what happened so that she never forgets again. As Hinata tries to leave the school, she runs into the Hammer Man, Mr. Tanaka, one final time. She plunges the knife into his chest, telling him that it's finally time to rest. She tries to leave, and again he attacks her from behind. Sir, it's over, she says, 
and plunges the knife into his side, his neck, and then his stomach. This time, finally, he stops moving. She exits and spots the sun rising over the snow in the distance. Ah, that memory she's had all this time. This was it. And it wasn't the sunset, but rather sunrise. The final thing she saw after killing Sayoko and leaving the school. The time her memories turned off to protect her. She's finally back in the real world. Hinata checks her phone and tries to call Masaki. She hears a phone ring behind her. Wait, he's nearby? She runs back into the building, only to be greeted with a horrifying sight. Masaki's phone lies on the floor, ringing, right next to his dead body. That second shadow she stabbed, it wasn't Mr. Tanaka. It was her fiancé, Masaki. And now... He's dead at her hand. Serves you right, Sayako says, grinning with glee and then fade to black. So I actually came across this story first as a manga, and then I saw it was based off a novel. I enjoyed the manga so much that I had to buy the novel as well, but they are pretty much beat for beat, even word for word at times, the exact same thing. So if your Japanese skills aren't quite high enough to read full novels yet, then the manga is a great option and you won't really miss out on too much. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to pick them up for yourselves. Is this worth picking up? Absolutely. I found the mystery really keeps this story moving and constantly intriguing, but even if you know the twists and turns that are coming, they don't really detract from it. If anything, a second or even third reading enhances the story and reveals all the little details that were hidden right from the start. We start with a very Kisaragi Station-esque setup, with Hinata seemingly passing out on a train and waking up at an empty station. Perfect, already a setting I love. Then she finds a dead body outside warning of shadowy creatures watching them wherever they go. Great. Now it's even more horrifying. But as the story continues, it delves into more Silent Hill-esque territory. This place really isn't what it seems. It's Takenoyama, but it's not. It's a place of punishment. Much like James in Silent Hill 2, it exists to force Hinata to remember the horrific crimes she committed, crimes that she made herself forget. Let's not mince words here. Hinata is a horrible person. Not only did she turn a blind eye to bullying, she actively participated in it when it started to encroach on her happy life, and then she became an actual murderer when things spun out of control. And all of that rage and her own victim complex is still within her. She abused her own grandparents, the only people on the planet still willing to look after her, and she'll probably do the same to her fiancé as well. She constantly tells herself that she's done nothing wrong and that everyone else is at fault. Harasaki is her pyramid head. Harasaki exists to punish Hinata, constantly, until she can finally accept that she is a terrible, terrible person who committed awful atrocities. Harasaki, the vengeful spirit of Sayoko, lures Hinata back to Takenoyama constantly, forces her to endure unending horrors and relive the events she made herself forget over and over. And, up until the point where this story takes place, Hinata was never strong enough to handle it. She could never go the whole way and unlock all her memories. She was too weak. That was always her problem. And so, she would return to the real world, oblivious once again, until the next time Harasaki decided to summon her back for another round of punishment. Takenoyama is her silent hill, and Harasaki her pyramid head, there to guide her towards the horrifying truth while punishing her along the way. It's a hell of her own creation, and it won't end until she finally accepts who she really is. Or will it? That ending sure is a zinger, and it's left open-ended enough that we can assume that Harasaki probably won't stop there. She'll continue summoning Hinata back to Takenoyama until she dies of old age, torturing her for the rest of her life. 
it's nothing less than she deserves, after all. I've even seen Japanese reviews call this story out as basically being a carbon copy of Silent Hill, and if you're familiar with how 2 goes in particular, then much of this story won't surprise you. I wouldn't go that far. It's certainly heavily inspired, but it's far from a straight copy. There are plenty of twists and turns and unique takes, and I dare say the only thing that's the same is the idea of a location existing as a place of punishment for someone who refuses to acknowledge what they did. If that idea intrigues you, then it's hard to go wrong with Harasaki. I'm kind of hoping they'll make a movie out of this someday, but at this point, I guess we'll have to wait and see. The ease with which it was adapted into a manga gives me hope that they wouldn't have to cut too much to make a decent movie as well. Here's hoping. But that is Harasaki, a novel I definitely recommend to pick up if you're after a horrifying mystery and a dive into how dark the human soul can really get. But what did you guys think? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you again next time.